Hello everyone. I welcome you once again to the next session of the course on fluid mechanics. So in the previous video, we discussed about the basic concepts of the fluid mechanics. So in this video, we will talk about so these were the objectives of the chapter one. So we covered two objectives in the previous video. In this video, we will try to understand the different types of flow conditions. Before we start the different flow conditions, we will have a look into the no slip condition first. So here we will take into consideration a case of a flow over a flat plate. This yellow in color is a flat plate on which the flow is taking place with some velocity u. So the flow basically takes place in the form of flares. We are all aware of that. So the layer which will be near to the wall will have to face the maximum resistance. So if the resistance will be maximum then the velocity will be minimum for a layer which will be near to the wall. So this layer which will be in contact with the wall or which will be in contact with the surface will be in a condition of no slip. It will try to adhere or try to stick with the flat plate or the wall. So this layer will have velocity nearly equals to zero. So this condition is called as the no slip condition when the fluid layer tries to stick with the solid surface. So the relative velocity of the layer adjacent to the solid surface is zero. So when we move away from the surface, the resistance decreases. So due to the decrease in the resistance, there is an increase in the velocity. So we get a this kind of a velocity profile. So these arrows basically depict the magnitude of the different velocity vectors. So here you can see it is zero and it is increasing as we are moving away from the wall. So a time will come when this local velocity small u will be nearly equals to the absolute velocity. So when this point will come when u will be equals to 0.99 times of capital U. So after that there will be no effect of the resistance which will be offered by the different layers. So after that the velocity will be a free stream velocity and the velocity will not change because the resistance offered by the different layers which was being transmitted from this flat surface will be nearly zero. So when the resistance will be minimum at that time the velocity will be maximum. So the region wherein the viscosity effects or the resistance is predominant is called as the boundary layer region and the region where this viscosity effects are negligible and velocity of each and every layer is nearly equal to the free stream velocity this region is car called as a far field region so in the boundary layer region u basically u is the local velocity is a function of y basically as we move away from the y velocity increases so boundary layer region as I told you is the region wherein the viscosity effects will be dominant whereas the far field region will be the region where the viscosity effects will not be dominant or it will be negligible. So an important property comes over here that is the boundary layer thickness. So it is basically the thickness of the layer region measured along the direction perpendicular to the direction of flow for a fully developed flow. So what a fully developed flow is, we'll talk about that in the coming slides. But here the important parameter is the boundary layer thickness. So this, this thickness 
which will be measured in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the flow. Flow direction is along x direction and the direction of this boundary layer thickness will be in the direction perpendicular to the x direction. So the thickness of the boundary layer will be denoted by delta wherein the viscosity effects are dominant. So it, this is called as the boundary layer thickness. The most important th thing is over here is that it is the no slip condition which is responsible for the dis, uh, development of this velocity profile because the velocity is zero over here and it has to increase when it moves away from this wall or away from this plate and has to attain a maximum value. So this no slip condition is basically responsible for this kind of velocity profile. So now the important aspect is classification of fluid flows. First of all, viscous and inviscid flows. So viscous flows, as the name indicates, the flows which will have the significant viscous effects or which will have the significant frictional effects are called as the viscous, viscous flows, which means where we will take into consideration the viscosity, where the viscosity effects will be dominant are called as the viscous flows. And the regions where the viscosity effects will not be dominant are called as the regions of inviscid flow. Viscosity effects are basically less in comparison to the other effects, inertial or pressure effects in case of the inviscid flows. So a typical example again of uh, an example of a flow over a flat plate so here again same example is there so wherever the viscosity effects are dominant or within the boundary layer region we can say so these these regions of the flow are called as the flow of viscous region and the flow in this region we can call this re this flow as a viscous flow and the regions where the effect of viscosity will be minimum or will be less will be called as the flow of the inviscid region. So we know that the flow with, with, without viscosity is not possible. There will always be some sort of velocity. So generally we neglect the viscosity in case of inviscid flows because viscosity is always there but we neglect that viscosity just to simplify the analysis without appreciable compromise in accuracy. Basically the viscosity is always there but it is very small in comparison to the other effects such as inertial effects or the effects due to pressure. So viscous and inviscid flows is one classification. Secondly, we will talk about the internal and external flows. As the name indicates, external flows are the flows which take place over the solid surfaces without the confined boundaries. And internal flows basically takes place within the confined boundaries and within the solid surfaces. So this is a typical example of external flow over a car wherein you can see the contours and the flow basically is taking place over the car. It is a typical case of an external flow. There are other, other examples also. The simple example of internal flow is a water flow which is taking place through a pipe. And also the another example of external flow is the air flow over a ball. You can see a cricket ball or a golf ball or a football. The flow over the ball takes place and it is a typical case of an external flow. There is one more category called as the open channel flow. When the flow takes place in the duct, duct is basically a confined space. When the flow takes place in the duct and when the top level of the water or top level of the liquid will not be in contact with the top level of the duct or there will be a free surface simply we can say then that case is called as an open channel flow although that flow is taking within the confined boundary but it has a free stream or it has a layer free surface which is not uh, which is not in contact with the internal surface of the duct so that case will be called as an open channel flow 
or open channel flow also takes place in uh, channels you can see wherein you can see the top surface uh, of the water flow is not in contact with any any wall so second case is uh, the compressible and incompressible flows it is the another classification again the word compressible and incompressible compressible signifies uh, the characteristics of different these kinds of flows so a flow is said to be incompressible if there is no appreciable change in density which means the flow cannot be compressed so when there will be change in the density during the course of flow it will be called as a compressible flow so basically liquids generally are incompressible in nature you take an example of oil you take an example of water upon the application of certain pressure the liquids cannot be compressed although there is very small compression but it is negligible we neglect that in comparison to the gases whereas wherein if we apply some pressure there will be a compression and and there will be an appreciable change in the density or you can say there will be change in the volume also so you might have obs observed the case of a liquefied petroleum gas basically the gas is under compressed conditions filled in the cylinders so this is a typical case of a gas compression so if the Mach number is less than 0.3 gases flow can be assumed to be incompressible this is a special case where we, we can assume that the, the the gas flow is also incompressible when Mach number is less than 0.3 so uh, why we assume that there will be an incompression or there will be an incompressible fluid when the Mach number is less than 0.3 the reason is that the density change is very less in that case and the density change is basically less than 0.5 uh, less than 5 percent so if the density change is very less so it is almost an incompressible flow as I have told you in case told you that in case of an incompressible flow the, uh, there is no appreciable change in the density So the next classification is a steady and unsteady flow. So when there will be a change in the flow properties with respect to time, that case is called as the case of unsteady flow. And when the flow, flow properties do not change with respect to time, that case is a case of steady flow. So in steady flow, the flow properties are a function of uh, or not a function of uh, time, whereas in unsteady flow, the flow properties are a function of time. So same is the case with the uniform and non-uniform flows. A uniform flow is that flow where the flow properties do not change with respect to space coordinates. If there will be change in the properties with respect to the space coordinates, that case is called as a case of non-uniform flow. So basically we have different types of devices, basically those which work uh, under the conditions whenever there is no change in the flow properties with respect to time. So such devices basically are called as the steady flow devices. So we have the examples of the steady flow devices. These are heat exchangers, turbines and compressors. So in engineering applications, flow can never be uniform, but there is a possibility that flow may be a steady or unsteady flow. So uh, we, we cannot expect that the flow will be uniform because it is not possible. It is certainly not possible because flow properties doesn't remain constant with respect to the space coordinates. There is always some change. So flow can be steady flow, flow can be an unsteady flow and flow can be non-uniform flow, but a uniform flow is not possible. So the next classification is the natural and forced flows. The word natural itself indicates that the flow will be basically purely due to the natural effects and the natural effects may be the density difference. So uh, due to the density difference, we have observed that, that there will be a rise in the gases which are warmer in comparison to the gases which are cooler. Cooler gases always tends to settle down whereas lighter gases tends to rise. This is certainly due to the density difference between these two gases. So this case is a typical example of natural flow.
whereas in case of a forced flow the flow is made to fluid over an external surface by means of a duct or by means of an external device uh, this can be your fan can be your blower so basically these devices try to create the external effect and that kind of a, a flow case is called as the case of a forced flow the next case is or next classification is the laminar and turbulent flows very important laminar and turbulent flows you might have uh, listen this word in your previous classes also so a laminar flow basically uh, is a flow uh, which is characterized by highly ordered ordered pattern essentially in which the streamlines move parallel to each other that there will be no interference of the streamlines a smooth or a flow in a very laminar fashion so basically the flows which are having the high viscosity are the laminar flow suppose uh, you can see a high viscosity oil which will be flowing so there will be no turbulence in that there will be no chaotic behavior in that so it because it has a high viscosity so the flow in uh, case of an oil or in case of an honey will be laminar whereas the turbulent flows are characterized by highly disordered motion and velocity fluctuations this is the case with the flows which will have the low viscosities with the fluids which will have the low viscosities and high velocities so in that there will be an interference of uh, lines and there will be a highly chaotic behavior so transitional flow is basically a flow regime which will be in between the laminar and turbulent flows so let us see the example of laminar and turbulent flows so in that case you can see the Although we cannot uh, recognize the uh, lines, but you can see the flow behavior is smooth. So this is a case, typical case of a laminar flow. But in that case, you can see that the fluid layers are mixing with each other, and uh, it is not uh, not uh, in a well mannered or it, in not in a uh, smooth pattern. So this kind of flow is called as a turbulent flow. So, how we will differentiate between a laminar and a turbulent flow? This is basically uh, the difference between these two is made by means of a dimensionless number, which was given by Reynolds. That's why it is called as a Reynolds number. It is basically used to characterize the different flow regimes. Reynolds number is the ratio of inertial forces to the viscous forces. So, we try to measure the ratio of inertia force to the viscous force. If the Reynolds number, you can, uh, we'll get the formula of Reynolds number by rho V L by mu, where rho is the density of the fluid, V is the velocity, L is the characteristic dimension. Characteristic dimension for a flat plate can be the length of the flat plate, and for a pipe flow, it can be the diameter. So it's a diameter of the pipe. So it is a characteristic dimension. We will discuss uh, regarding the Reynolds number in the coming classes, and where mu is the viscosity, dynamic viscosity. So more inertia force means higher Reynolds number, and less uh, more viscous force means less Reynolds number. So in case of laminar flows, viscosity effects are uh, dominant in comparison to the inertial effects so Reynolds number for laminar flow is generally less and for turbulent flows inertial forces are dominant because velocity is much more high and viscosity is less so Reynolds number is high in case of turbulent flows so the turbulent flows are characterized by the high Reynolds number and laminar flows are characterized by the low Reynolds number for a flow through a pipe the Reynolds number of less than 2300 will correspond to a laminar flow and Reynolds number more than 4000 will correspond to a turbulent flow in between 2300 to 4000 the flow is generally the transitional one So in this slide, we will talk about uh, the last classification of uh, fluid flows that is one dimensional, two dimensional and three dimensional flows. 
a flow is said to be one dimensional if the flow variation or the fluid properties vary only in one direction that means it is a function of only one space coordinate and time coordinate so for a two dimensional flow the properties are a function of two space coordinates and one time coordinate so so and so on and so forth for the three dimensional flows so if we take a typical example of a flow through a pipe so for a flow through a pipe the flow is also two dimensional as well as one dimensional so in a flow developing region the flow is two dimensional and in one uh, in a fully developed flow region the flow is one dimensional so what is a flow developing region and fully developed region we will understand so we have a case where in the flow is taking place through a pipe and flow has just started from this point so uh, the flow profile at the entrance region is like was this wherein the effect of viscosity has not been transmitted so here it is a no slip condition since we have the two walls in that case otherwise it is like a uh, it's it's a two dimensional figure you can see so you can see the two walls but uh, the circumference of the pipe will act as a wall so in all that in all those cases there will be a no slip condition and the flow velocity will be zero so here we can see only two points where the flow velocity is zero so the velocity profile is likewise this so when we move away from this we will see that uh, the viscosity effects are dominant and we can see here the velocity is zero and it is maximum at the center because the resistance is minimum over there so when we move ahead we can see this kind of a uh, profile which is which will be after some length after the flow has traveled some distance so after that the flow profile will remain same it will not change so when the profile doesn't change that region is called as the region of the fully developed flow and when there is a change in the flow profile you can see the flow profile or the velocity profile is like this it's flat then it is some it has some curvature the curvature has just increased so this region is basically called as the flow developing region so also if you take into consideration the boundary layer thickness because it is a region of the boundary layer this is a boundary layer you can see it is always formed where the the effects of velocity are there here in this region you can see the velocity effects are there so the boundary layer of thickness over here is this and so here in, in that case you can see the flow velocity profile is there because in that region it is a variable then there is no change in this region so and uh, here you can see that the flow velocity profile is changing so whenever there is a change in the velocity from the wall to the far field region to the region away from the wall that region basically the thickness of that region basically gives you the boundary layer thickness as discussed in the previous cases and boundary layer thickness generally we measure in case of a developed flow and not in a developing flow here we cannot measure the boundary layer thickness because the flow is not developed so in the previous slide i discussed about the uh, developed flow boundary layer thickness of the developed flow so it, it will be in case of a developed flow so here you can see uh, as the flow developing region the 2d flow is there why 2d flow is there uh, the flow properties the flow property over here is velocity you can see as you are moving towards that side there is also change in the velocity here you can see the velocity is less velocity vector is minimum here it is more here it is again more so you can see along the length there is a change in the flow velocity and there is also change with respect to the radial direction you can see here here the viscosity uh, velocity is minimum it is increasing so it is a function of l as well as r in case of a developing flow so the flow in case of a developing flow region is two dimensional because it is dependent upon the two coordinates that is r as well as l2 space coordinates but when we talk about the fully developed flow you will see that this kind of a velocity profile will be there when you move towards that side so in that case the flow direction the flow variation or velocity is varying only in the radial direction and in y direction the velocity will not change because these 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 velocity uh, uh, vectors will have the same magnitude when you move towards that side that's why this regime is also called as a flow developed 
a fully developed region of the flow so in a fully developed region of the flow you will find that the velocity is a function of r only it is only varying in radial direction whereas in this case you will feel that it is a function of r as well as l so here the flow is two dimensional and here the flow is one dimensional so generally you can feel that the fluid flow is a three dimensional in nature for simplification analysis we take into consideration the variation in 1d as well as two dimensional otherwise there is a change in the third dimension in that case also but that change is not appreciable or it is negligible in comparison to the change in that case so for simplification of analysis we take that the flow is one dimensional or two dimensional otherwise the flow is generally three dimensional so these were the books that were consulted during the course of action so i thank you once again uh, for watching this video in this video we covered the concept of uh, no slip condition what is no slip condition and different fluid flow conditions classification of the fluid flows so in the next slide or in the next video we will talk about a very important concept called as the concept of continuum and we will also discuss the newtonian a uh, newton's law of viscosity newtonian and non newtonian fluids so we will cover these these important topics in the next video so till then i thank you thank you very much